Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here on this rainy evening in Atlanta. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Please add your questions for Jennifer Jewell in the Q&A box. We're in for a great treat this evening, and I'm super excited about this talk. And I'm looking forward to getting started momentarily. Thanks for being here. Well, welcome everyone to the Cherokee Garden Library virtual talk featuring Jennifer Jewell. We're very excited this evening and um, we're gonna give you a little background and then get started. The Cherokee Garden Library was established by the Cherokee Garden Club of Atlanta in 1975 and is named for our state flower, the Cherokee Rose. This library is one of the special collections here at the Keenan Research Center of the Atlanta History Center. And the Cherokee Garden Library collects and preserves rare and contemporary books, periodicals, manuscript collections, and visual arts collections ranging in date from 1586 to the present. These collections tell the diverse stories of horticulture and botanical history in the southeastern United States and areas of influence throughout the world. The library is deeply connected to the Atlanta History Center's Gazueta Gardens, a remarkable 33 acre green space that contains nine distinct ecologically beneficial and educational gardens. I invite you to learn more about these gems of the Atlanta History Center via our website and in person if you're in the Atlanta area. I began listening to Jennifer Jewell's podcast, Cultivating Place in 2017. And after the second episode I listened to, I quickly became a devotee. I was so delighted when Jennifer agreed to be our in-person speaker in April of last year. Of course, her talk was postponed due to the pandemic. So I am thrilled she is here with us virtually this evening to discuss her fantastic book, the Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the World of Plants. And we hope to have her return in person in the future to discuss her new book, Under Western Skies, Visionary Gardens from Rockies to the Pacific Coast, that I think was just released officially this week. Jennifer is the creator, writer, and host of Cultivating Place, Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden. And this is a weekly radio program and series of podcasts where she finds engaging people to interview about their work in the gardening world. She is also a really avid gardener herself, an educator, and a gardening advocate. Jennifer is interested in the intersections between gardens, the native plant environments around them, and human culture. She comes by her deep love of interest in gardening in the natural world from her parents. Someone recently noted and described her radio program and podcast, Cultivating Place, as the on being for gardeners and nature lovers. So these are two of my very favorite <laughs> national public radio programs in the world. And I think that's the perfect description. Jennifer, congratulations on your new book being released this week. I am thrilled you are joining us from Northern California. You have a huge fan base here in Atlanta. So we're glad to bring you to our city virtual to, virtually tonight to discuss your first wonderful book, The Earth in Her Hands. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Stacy. It is really a joy to be here, especially after our year plus conversation trying to get me there. And I showed you this earlier, but I just want people to see that the beautiful invitation you made for the talk for last year 
has pride of place on my desk in Northern California every day. So um, I, I just, I really appreciate that uh, introduction and I appreciate your interest in the podcast and in the book. And I'm really excited to share more about it with the audience there tonight. So thank you very much. Well, thank um, you so much. And I'm gonna drop off into the audience for your talk and then I'll come back to you at, um, at the end of your talk for some Q&A. Okay. I know people will have some great questions. All right. Well, I'll be, I'll be excited to talk to you then. And in the meantime, I'll get all passionate and, and <laughs> sort of righteous about the, the gardeners I'm talking about. So thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, it's just, it's really a pleasure to be here. I understand it's cold and rainy in Atlanta, if that is where you're listening from. Uh, here in Northern California, it was 97 degrees today, and I'm sure you're reading the headlines about our record drought. And um, all of these things matter to us as, as gardeners, um, no matter where we live. So um, Stacy gave me a beautiful introduction. And I want to start out by uh, sort of expanding on that introduction. And um, the, the first thing I want to say is that everything I do, whether it's on the radio program or it's in a book or it's in a talk, is predicated on this belief that gardeners and gardens are these potentially really powerful agents and spaces for positive change in our world. And, you know, that maybe sounds like a little bit of a, of a catchphrase um, of the moment, uh, that, that idea of, of intersectional and agents of change. But I wanna drill down into that a little bit for you so that it becomes more meaningful than just, um, you know, a sound bite. And I think that Everybody in the audience tonight, whether you're part of a garden club or you are a fan of the, you know, since 1973 Cherokee Garden Library, which is a, a fantastic institution of its own right, influencing and deepening our gardening world, you will know what I mean when I say that gardening is one of those cultural connectors that bridges all other identifiers that might divide us. This is an identifier that actually connects us across time and space, across culture, across age, across politics, across just about anything. And in that way, it is like art or music or food or great literature. And it is this common ground that elevates us as humans. And one of my greatest hopes is that my work helps to elevate the way we think about and the way we talk about gardening. And we put it into a place of rightful value as a culture. And I think that as a 55 year old woman, the daughter of a gardener, the daughter of a wildlife biologist, um, I, I first started my career as a, uh, a English literature major. I went on to be an editor. And then I started to bring together my love of writing and my home-based, hobby-based love of gardening um, by being a garden writer. And I was writing for glossy magazines. And I, I started to understand, and this was maybe 25 years ago, that the way that mainstream media was talking about gardening and representing gardening in the pages of magazines or newspapers, uh, or even you know great books, uh, was a very, very thin slice of what I actually experienced gardening to be. Now, I say gardening is a potential space and agent of positive change because for example, in the last census, which I believe was 2018, 38% of all U.S. households identified as being gardeners. That is 49 million households in the USA today engage in gardening at some level. But only one-fifth of those households identified as organic gardeners or habitat gardeners or community or social justice gardeners. And so 
what we do know as gardeners is that we can actually contribute to some of the bigger problems in our world, environmental degradation, um, social division, social and economic division. And, but we can also be part of the solutions to those problems. And so that's where, where I see my work uh, as being important is that it helps to encourage and empower and inform and engage gardeners across the globe to embrace the power that they have in this activity they love in a way that they often don't because the culture hasn't valued gardening per se in a larger way in the last 50 to 75 years. And so we will catch ourselves as gardeners saying things like, you know what someone will say what did you do today and i'll say oh nothing i didn't you know i i just gardened today and yet gardening is a practice like meditation or prayer or reading it is a valuable action and it makes a difference in our world um i will so so that is the the premise for everything I do. In 2008, I moved or seven, I moved to Northern California from Colorado, where I was born and raised. And it was at that point that I realized I didn't want to write for the magazines anymore. I wanted to do something that pulled us away from just thinking about gardening in a two dimensional imagistic way. And while we all love a good garden picture, we love them in our own gardens, we love them of other people's gardens, we also know that our gardens are much more than that. They are a 365 day a year relationship that we have, and they don't always look pretty, and they don't always make perfect pictures, but they are absolutely worth um, lifting up and using them as transformational engagements in our world. And so when I moved to Northern California and I knew I wanted to move away from the garden writing I was doing, and I wanted to tell more stories about why we garden versus stories about how we garden. I wanted to show more about what our gardens mean and less about what they look like. Although all four of those things are clearly important to us as gardeners. And so I was driving down the road in Northern California and I heard a sort of uh, call on my public radio station saying uh, that they needed volunteer PSA writers. And I thought, I can write a PSA. And public radio is the perfect way to talk about what I want to talk about because it's all about voice instead of about looks. And so in 2016, my original public radio program, which had been running since 2008 on my public radio station, North State Public Radio, uh, actually grew up into this one hour globally focused interview-based program that we know today, which is Cultivating Place, Conversations on Natural History and the Human Impulse to Garden. And almost seven years, six years into it, and having interviewed people all over the world, I can tell you it only gets deeper and broader and more interesting to me, and the guests get ever more engaging. The in 2017, after the Cultivating Place had been airing for a year, I was approached by Timber Press, uh, a horticultural press out of Portland, Oregon, asking me if I might be interested in writing a book on women in horticulture. And they were uh, knowledgeable about my podcast, and so they knew the lens that I was using to engage with my guests. And I said, as long as it can uh, use this same intersectional lens uh, on what is important and how we can change the, the way in which we talk about and think about and the paradigms that surround gardening in our world to make them far more inclusive and expansive than I'm all in. Their only request to me was that I did not write about dead English white women. And that made me laugh because uh, of course that was the least interesting thing to me although we love many, many good dead English white women gardeners in our world, but there is a lot more that we can be talking about at this time. And so I accepted their offer. And the first thing that I said to them was, it's gonna take me a little while to actually put my head around what I even mean by horticulture or the plant world at this point. Like, 
who does that include? What fields does that include? And I, I put together this sort of Gantt chart of the different fields of expertise that inform and are built on what we think of as gardening or horticulture in, in our world today, currently. And a couple of the other parameters as I was determining these fields of expertise and then starting to populate each field with interesting women around the world, um, there were a couple of parameters that we set in part just to make it an actually feasible task in one year to get done. Um, so one of those was that they are all living women during doing current and innovative visionary work in the world. Work that isn't just good because there are a lot of people doing good work, but work that actually expands how we think about and how we talk about and how we engage in gardening. And you'll see what I mean as I introduce you to some women of the women as we go along. But that was really important to me um, that those criteria were met. Now, people often ask me like, why 75? How did you get to 75? And it's really a conceit, right? It is, I could have done 500. There are so many interesting people, the more you dig into this in the world. But I had to pick a number and boundaries are healthy. And so 75, it was. So without doubt, you're gonna look at the list of women in this book and you're gonna say, I can't believe you forgot that one. And um, what about this one? And there are so many that could be here that aren't. And to that, I say, this is not a final list. This is an invitation to every one of us as gardeners and garden readers and garden shoppers in this world and garden enthusiasts to find the names of all the humans doing good work in this world in this way and celebrate them, raise them up, share their names and support them in their endeavors. So the other conceit in a weird way is that it's just about women because you know, as a 55 year old woman with two daughters in this world, I think to myself, is that just sexist to write about just women? And in a world that needs a lot less sexism rather than more sexism, uh, I say it probably is sexist, but I also will tell you that I believe that it is sexist for a good reason, and that reason is representation. So as you look at these fields of expertise, you will notice perhaps that some of them have long been inhabited by women, women in leadership positions, in decision-making roles. Uh, floriculture comes to mind automatically. Herbalism comes right to mind, as does uh, garden writing. There are a lot of strong women voices that have been in those fields for a good long time. Some of the other areas have not been long inhabited by women, nor have they had or do they have still anywhere close to representational uh, numbers of women in leadership positions. And this is another phrase, uh, representation matters, that will kind of sound like a moment uh, you know, a, a current moment sound bite. But I will tell you that as I was looking through each of these fields and I was researching um, who were making differences, who were the, the, the influencers and the change makers and the leaders in these fields, and it became clear to me that in any one of these fields, you have just one woman let alone a young woman or a very old woman or a woman of color or different socioeconomic background than the norm in these leadership positions in these fields. You have just one woman in a leadership position in this field and you change everything. You change what career access looks like. You change the experiential diversity sitting at the tables, making decisions in these fields. And when I say that, I mean, very specifically that as I was researching and interviewing the women in this book, it was clear that their experience coming up in the world was very, very different than the experiences of men coming up in those same roles in those same fields. Right off the bat, one of the, the key differences still today in 2018, when I was uh, doing the research and the interviewing for this book, a large number of these women had determined that they would take on a flexible career in order to help either take care of their young people or of their elders. 
one of the women who I requested be in the book actually had to politely decline participation in the book because as she wrote back, and this is a tenured professor at a major university in the state of California. She wrote back, I am very sorry to decline, but I have just taken early retirement in order to take care of my mother full time as she has early onset Alzheimer's. And I had to stop and think to myself, how many men in our world would issue that same statement? That is not a judgment. I, I love all good humans in this world, but it is still a clear difference between genders and roles in our world today. And that is interesting to me. The, and that right there, you change the experiential diversity sitting at those tables making decisions and that different experience leading to their position provides them with different values and priorities with which they make decisions. And when you change the values and priorities that are making decisions at any table, leadership table, you change what leadership looks like. And when you change what leadership looks like, you all of a sudden actually have a chance to make a difference and change individual and community health and well-being, environmental health and well-being, economic health and well-being, cultural norms and social justice, and cultural literacy. And when you can start moving the needle on these major concepts in our cultural world today, then we stand a chance to actually see a different and more resilient and healthy future. And so this is some of what led to The Earth in Her Hands. This is the book, and I am excited to share more with, it, uh, with you about it tonight. There are 75 women, and I was asked to speak for 45 minutes, so I better keep moving <laughs> because I'm already going long in my enthusiasm. Um, but I will share a handful, and I will hope that you can find the book uh, at the library or in a local bookstore, maybe right there at the Cherokee Garden Library, and read more about some of these women. Because what happens when you read all of their stories, one by one, linked together, you actually get this sort of blueprint of what we all can be doing, even in small ways, with our own gardening practice and love, to improve what we are most worried about in this world, whatever that might be. You know, it might be the environmental crisis and catastrophe we see imminent in our world. It might be the cultural division. It might be nothing more uh, complicated than trying to improve the biodiversity in the front gardens along your neighborhood street so that children can see bees and birds and bugs. That right there, that is a beautiful cultural impact you will have as a gardener in this world. So I want to start out, uh, one, of, one of the other questions that people asked me was, how did you organize the book? And Ultimately, none of these women, no matter which field of expertise I had listed them in and I had represented them in, uh, none of them were so single focused as to want to fit easily into any one box. And so the way I will introduce them to you today is by the bigger, you know, kind of cultural concepts that I see them having the greatest impact in. And diversity, again, a very of the moment topic, and it should be, and it should have been much greater a topic over much longer a period of time, because if our gardens teach us anything, it is that the greater the biodiversity, the greater the garden. And that is certainly writ large in, in our world as humans and as greater than human beings in, in the world. Um, one of the things that I was very intent on was that I wouldn't just be representing um, a, a, a one single section of women. I would be representing as great a diversity of women as I possibly could. And when I say diversity, I mean of age, of orientation, of background, of interest and passion, and certainly of uh, their own advocacy in the world. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Leah Penniman. She is the founder and director of Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York. In 2011, 
Leah and her husband, Joa, Jonah Vitale Wolf, uh, were living in Albany and they had two small children. They were both college graduates. They both had great jobs. They had decided uh, very consciously to live in a community of diversity in Albany so that their children had that experience growing up. They also decided to be car free in order to have as little a carbon footprint as they could as a young family. And what quickly became clear to them as parents of two small children was that given those two things that they had chosen in where they lived and how they lived, it took them not one, but two buses to get to a grocery store that had fresh fruits and vegetables, let alone local fresh fruits and vegetables. And what they realized is that with their privilege of having a two parent household, having two jobs, having college degrees, that if this was difficult for them, then it was almost impossible for the other people living in their community who did not have these same privileges that they had. And they decided that they wanted to do something about it. And so in 2011, they started Soul Fire Farm, which was a, a farm that they worked hard to save the money for, to buy the land for, to develop a CSA that would provide fresh fruits and vegetables back to this community that they had been living in. And as they, uh, this is uh, Jonah and the two kids and Leah, as they started their CSA and they started uh, within the first year and a half, they were providing 320 fresh food uh, CSA boxes back into the community they had lived in. And what they realized was that it was a bigger problem than just access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so they determined to expand the focus of Soul Fire Farm into being a place that was, now I'm going to read this so I get it exactly right because I, I really love this. Um, their current focus now, as they have expanded all these years since 2011, is being an Afro-Indigenous centered community farm committed to uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system through empowering sustainable agriculture, natural building, spiritual activism, health and environmental justice. As Leah kept doing this work, kept being in the community, kept speaking to people, kept speaking to groups, other young people of color and of, of a variety of backgrounds would say, I want to learn how to do this. I want to do this. And so not only did she and her family and this farm and this community come together to help re-engage the Black community and the Indigenous community with their rightful dignified relationship with the land, but she is also now growing young farmers of color and providing means to access to land and education and community. And that right there is a powerful impact in our world. If you have not heard of her before, I think you would be very interested in her book, Farming While Black, uh, which tells the story of and reclaims the stories of the incredible contributions the Black community has had to what we think of as American agricultural history and knowledge and uh, a progress in our world. Uh, it is a phenomenal book worth reading, and I think it should be required reading for every high school student in the U.S. today. Uh, the next person I would like to introduce you to is Claire Cooper Marcus. Claire Cooper Marcus is a retired professor from the University of California, Berkeley. She was in their uh, landscape architecture department, not as a landscape architect, but more as a, a philosopher and a social commentator, uh, a theoretician, if you will. Um, it was in the last years of her tenure at UC Berkeley that she actually began doing the work that she is now most well known for. And that is in the field of evidence-based healing and therapeutic landscapes specifically in medical environments. So Claire is from the United Kingdom and she came to the US as a, a young college student and has remained here uh, her, the rest of her life. In her, these last years of her work at UC Berkeley, she was approached by one of her postdoc students saying, I would like to do a, a research 
project on the impact of gardens in hospitals and other medical settings. And Claire thought that is really, that's really interesting. And I don't think a lot has been done on it. A little bit had been done on it and they contacted the people who had started to do some of this research. When I say evidence-based design, um, it again is one of those phrases that we hear and it kind of goes right over our heads. But as I interviewed her and read her books, the first one is called Healing Gardens and the second one is called Therapeutic Landscapes, both written in collaboration with postdoc uh, uh, students of hers uh, and now colleagues of hers in this field. What, what, uh, what we mean when we say evidence-based is that um, and you'll have to follow me here because this is how I had to learn this. Um, and it kind of expands your view of what we mean. If I say a healing garden, um, I think most of us who have gardens will say, well, it's a garden. Of course it's healing. And a lot of hospitals and medical facilities, nursing homes, outpatient facilities, uh, rehab centers, we're, we're also using the same kind of low level standard for what a healing garden actually is. And so you would think to yourself, it's a garden, it has plants, it has flowers, it has fresh air, that's healing. But consider this, if you are a cancer patient and you are recovering and you're in chemo and you are experiencing a lot of nausea and the hospital that you are in puts their garden right next to the cafeteria and all of the fumes from the cafeteria are being uh, put out into the garden and you smell these smells the whole time, all of a sudden that is not healing, that is nauseating. If you are a, uh, a veteran and you are experiencing PTSD and you are in therapy for that or getting uh, treatment for that in a facility and a, a hospital or a rehab facility has put a garden right next to the road or right next to the loading dock at the hospital and you hear bangs and clangs and, and loud noises and loud voices, that is not healing to you. That garden is stressful and anxiety provoking to you. And so the more research these uh, women have done in this field, and the more that has been published about it, the more dialed in gardens can be to the specific healing nature and the uh, stakeholders, if you will, who will be using these gardens, making them much more effective and much more healing. And so they have now set, uh, Claire and her colleagues have now set standards for how you gather people together to get all the information you need from the, the medical staff, from um, nurses, from family members to the patients themselves on what exactly is healing. Claire teaches at the Chicago Botanic Garden where they have a fantastic uh, therapeutic garden called the Bueller Enabling Garden. One of her colleagues there is Barb Kresge, Kresge, who ran the horticultural therapy program there until she retired last year. And here again, they are actually bringing uh, horticulturalists from around the world into the Chicago Botanic Garden and giving them certification programs and training on exactly how to be a horticultural therapist in different settings for different populations. And it is absolutely expanding the, the range and the reach and the meaning of what it is to garden in this world. This is a picture, uh, an overview of the Bueller Enabling Gardening uh, Garden there at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And it shows you some of the um, kind of uh, state uh, or standard of care for gardens, some enclosure, but with exits, some uh, privacy, but not too private that you don't feel like you can get out, uh, you know, raised beds so that people in wheelchairs or in, with walkers or with um, even gurneys for young people who are uh, in, in such acute uh, disability uh, are able to be at the same height as these beds. Um, it, it is a phenomenal program and the horticultural therapy world is one of the great sort of expansions in, in the horticultural world today. 
In environmental health and well-being, I want to uh, introduce you to someone you probably know, especially there in the Atlanta area, uh, for those of you listening from Atlanta, and that is to Peggy Cornett, who is the curator of gardens at Monticello. And as uh, she's been there since 1983, so she's going on 40 years at Monticello, and she has alternately run programming, been the assistant to the director. She has run their um, Tufton Farm, uh, which is a uh, historic plant preservation and research center. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the Tufton Farm and heirloom and historic plant research is that it's not just on edible plants, but also on ornamentals and native plants, uh, you know, many of them informed and uh, contributed to by Thomas Jefferson and uh, the, the botanists that he was working with, such as the Lewis and Clark expedition to add to our knowledge. Um, of course, you know, Monticello was uh, a, a slave holding uh, of enslaved people estate. And one of the things I write in her profile, uh, and I think you will agree, is that, you know, garden history is like all world history. It is complicated. It is, it is messy and there are as many lives lost and gross injustices as there are lives saved and redeemed. And we cannot avoid that. And we, we uh, in, in Peggy's words, it is one of the most important things she does as the curator of plants and gardens there at Monticello is to face the um, travesty of enslavement from the origins of this place. And, and talk about them head on and not whitewash them so that we can move forward. And she has been um, involved in what is called Getting the Word. And that has been a program there at Monticello since I think at least 2017, if not earlier, trying to bring up all the research that they have and all of the documentation they have to fill out the pictures and the voices of the enslaved people who made Monticello exactly what it is, uh, including the, the stories and the contributions by Wormley Hughes, who was the enslaved head gardener uh, at the time of Thomas Jefferson. And this really adds to our comprehension of what it is to be a gardener, how we get information, how we preserve it, how we sort of learn from it in order to go better forward in our world as we move forward. The uh, in economic health and well-being, I want to speak to you about someone named Yolanda Burrell, who is the founder of and owner of Pollinate Farm and Garden, which up until last year with the pandemic was a brick and mortar farm and garden supply store in Oakland, California. Um, I do believe that a brick and mortar farm and garden store will return to, if not that exact site, to that community. Yolanda is a fantastic story of a woman who grew up in California, farming and gardening with her family, was a hobbyist gardener her whole life. She moved as an adult, as a, uh, a computer analyst, as her career uh, with her husband to the Oakland area. And she was, like many of us, really involved in different gardening groups in a um, in an urban agriculture group, in an edible garden group, in a um, cooking garden group. And one of the things she came to realize was that uh, as her hobby was getting more intense and much more comprehensive as a gardener at her home, she realized that she couldn't act, she didn't have access to uh, the supplies she needed, especially not a full, um, and you know, robust selection of those supplies. And she, she either had to drive an hour and a half, two hours to get to a supply area, or she had to kind of you know, compromise and go to a big box store where you had you know, three types of, of everything and that was it. And as you and I know, there's a lot more out there than that. And a lot of it is better quality, more interesting, um, and more useful to us as gardeners. So like she couldn't even get shade cloth she had to drive so far. And so she determined that she really wanted to 
bring a farm and garden store directly to her community so that her community, young and old and new and well-established, could have access to not just the supplies, but the learning and the community of people sharing knowledge that comes with such a center. And as she likes to say, uh, which is something that I just, I love uh, this quote of hers, is that if you go back in any family uh, history, one generation, two generations, maybe three, maybe four, but you go back far enough and every single one of us is a land-based person somewhere back there. And so she didn't see her classes on canning and cooking and preserving and chickens and goats and cover crops. She didn't see these classes as teaching people something they didn't know. She saw these classes as reminding you of what we all know somewhere in our cellular memory. Um, moving along to public policy, I, I really want to applaud and celebrate Mary Pat Matheson, the CEO and president of the Atlanta Botanical Garden, since I think 2000. I think she started at the Atlanta Botanical Garden at the same time that Stacy uh, Catron became Catron became the director there at the Cherokee Garden Library, and. Um, you know, I, I, there are, I just wish there were so many more women in the book, Stacy among them. But Mary Pat Matheson uh, came to the Atlanta Botanic Garden from Red View Garden in Utah, a big change of um, environment, certainly. And when she came to the Atlanta Botanical Garden, she recognized that this garden, um, which is a relatively young botanical garden in the U.S., but still a, a major botanical garden in the U.S. at this point, she realized that it was falling in its membership numbers. It was falling in its donation and visitation numbers, and it was not serving the full demographic of the city of Atlanta. And as a, a bright thinking and curious and determined woman, she knew that there was not a simple answer to this problem. What I love about this uh, story and the way it has played out is that it is in fact, not just the story of the Atlanta Botanical Garden. It is in fact the story of every one of our cultural institutions. Well, maybe not everyone, but a great, a large part of them across the US from art museums to natural history museums to botanic gardens to libraries even, um, that this cultural institution was not serving the full demographic of its surrounding community. And she decided she was gonna do something about it. And she knew she couldn't do this single-handedly. She pulled together a, a group of uh, advisors to help her troubleshoot this. And she also was wise enough to understand that she could not solve this problem in an effective and sustainable, long lasting way by only addressing it from one level. So it, it wasn't just a matter of getting more members or just getting more donors. It was addressing the systemic problem with the way the Atlantic Botanic Atlanta Botanical Garden was built and thought about what they did. So uh, her team of people came up with what I think is one of the most just ingenious and effective plans at, uh, at addressing this issue. And the first thing they did was they uh, wrote a grant for uh, three years, I think, a three-year grant for free and reduced membership for every single public servant in the greater Atlanta area. So that is school teachers, firefighters, police people, um, bus drivers, uh, and, and the list goes on. But this one act reached one of the largest populations of working class people in Atlanta and said, we want you to come to this garden. We welcome you here. What she also realized was that she couldn't just invite a whole new group of people to the garden and have it be meaningful to them. She actually had to represent them in the programming, in the staff, 
in the internships, in the, the, the school groups who visited. And so she formed part, she and her team formed partnerships with the public school system, with the historically black colleges of the area and with, um, where's one other group, but she, she made sure that students were visiting from the time they were kindergarten, all the schools were visiting from the time they were kindergarten to the time they were in sixth grade every year. So they got to see a garden as part of their normal education every year in that time frame. She did. Uh, she provided volunteer and internship uh, opportunities for the high school students and then for the students in the college level so that they became their her pipeline for people who would be interested in this work and come to fill out her staff. She also made sure to fill out her staff with uh, of diversity of genders, of socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, racial diversity, so that when people came, they saw other people who looked like them and were interested in the same things and had the same experiential diversity and priorities that they had when they came to this garden. Since that time, since she took over, she took her membership from 10,000 to almost 50,000. She took her visitation from 130,000 a year to almost 600,000 a year. This has been an effective plan and this has been a cultural institution that has met this moment with grace and creativity and determination and I applaud them. Finally, I wanna to get to cultural literacy and I'm starting to go long now, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. I'm watching my clock. Um, if you have not heard of Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I really hope you have, I um, would love to introduce you to her. She is a professor and a director at the uh, State University of New York in upstate New York, and she is also the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, and I hope you've all read it. If you have, I think you should read it again. I think we should read it every year, and if you haven't, I would absolutely recommend you do. It will, um, it will make you a better, happier person and gardener. I really believe that. Um, she is a, a woman of Potawatomi, citizen Potawatomi and European descent. And she had always been interested in plants and botany. She went off to college and she started and she did her studies and she came to realize that her understanding from her family traditions and her cultural traditions uh, were very, very different than the way they were presented in a Western academ ac academic setting. And she uh, has spent her whole career trying to bring these two different fields together to make sure that the Western academic scientific background does not diminish or dismiss or erase the traditional ecological knowledge of the native peoples of the US and the world uh, and the knowledge that they bring to our study and understanding of plants, of plant communities, of ecology and of relationship. Um, as a teacher and as a writer, uh, this intersection, the symbiosis between these two different perspectives, making sure that it is an also and, not an either or, is one of the most important intersectional things she does in her work. And I would say that one of the greatest gifts she gives to us, besides this emphasis on bringing these two fields and uh, perspectives and mindsets together, is to really bring forward what she calls the teaching of plants. And among those teachings, the greatest of the teachings in her, in her words are gratitude and reciprocity and a much needed democracy of species. And uh, she is a great gift to our gardening and horticultural knowledge and mindset as we move into what we hope is a more resilient and healthy future altogether. Uh, Vandana Shiva is a, a seed keeper and an ecological advocate in our world today out of India. And this quote by her, uh, the future is based on a core of intelligence of evolution with the plants. Uh, artificial intelligence might help in algorithms to manipulate how and what we think, but it will not contribute to the next stage of human consciousness. 
of human evolution as a species on this beautiful earth as earth family. And this quote really brings to mind for me, uh, one of my greatest held, um, sorry, that's my cat's tail right there. Um, greatest held, belief, held beliefs, which is that our gardens are not just spaces. They're not just places of refuge for us, but they are in fact, documents. They are documents of moral and social and environmental meaning and importance. And they are these things in both what they do say and what they do include and what they don't say and what they don't include. And in a conscious culture of garden care and garden thoughtfulness, they are also love letters, right? They are love letters and praise songs and prayers in action. And I think that is uh, epitomized by every woman in this book who is using, they are sort of marrying their horticultural passion and knowledge with their greatest cares in the world. This is Midori Shintani. She's the head gardener at the Millennium Forest in Tokaido, Japan, a, a vast preserve of land that has been set aside by the uh, largest newspaper group in the country of Japan. And they specifically set this land aside to preserve it as an offset to what they understood their carbon footprint to be as an industry in Japan. And that right there, says worlds about uh, the way they are thinking and the values they are not just talking about, but acting on in our world. And I just love this picture of Midori who takes care of, I think there are 10 acres of really intensely cultivated display gardens, native plant gardens, um, interpretive gardens uh, that are part of this larger native plant uh, and uh, native environment preserve. But this right here, you know, reminds me that we as gardeners, we always start right with our feet in the mud and the muck and our hands and we're bent over that way. But if we're lucky and if we listen to the plants and learn from the plants and learn from the seeds and learn from the wildlife that are there with us in these spaces, then our gardens, they grow us up. They grow us up from our feet and hands in the dirt to our heads and our hearts in the stars, in the sky, looking up and forward in right proportion and right perspective. And I, I love this view of Midori with her face just reverent with joy, smaller than this gigantic Angelica that she is admiring. And that to me is, is our rightful place and our rightful perspective. And it also reminds us of what joy we find when we bring here. And if we as gardeners can harness that joy and share it forward, the way that the Cherokee Garden Club did when Ann Carr started it in 1973 uh, and then merged in 2005 with the, the History Center and Research Center, uh, the way that Stacy continues to, to grow that forward, and I'm sure the Garden Club does too, then we are like plants themselves. We are creating this succession planting of active and uh, encouraged and encouraging gardeners who are growing a more resilient future in which gardening is contributing all the time to being part of the solution. Um, and in that way, our gardens become compasses. They become directionals showing us where we wanna go and where we are going. And they orient us to the fact that our home is in our space in the garden, but it's also this larger planetary garden. And it's never about the earth being in their hands or my hands or your hands. It's about the earth being in all of our hands uh, as gardeners in this world. And um, as Stacy mentioned, this is my, my next book and it focuses in a very similar way on place-based gardens of the US West and um, really rounds out kind of the mission that I have with cultivating place um, and this marriage of people with their places growing a better world. And I just thank you all for being uh, with me tonight and your uh, caring gardening hearts out there in the world. 
Jennifer, thank you. Oh my gosh, I feel so inspired. I just want to jump up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I know there are many people in the audience that feel that way too. And we're at 7.55, so I'm putting my own questions aside. And I'm going to go to the Q&A box and just pull up a few and not be selfish. Um, so thank you so much. And I just want to say before I get to the Q&A, if you do not have this book, you need this book. It is inspiring. Thank you. It, it challenges you. It makes you think about a lot of things. I have ordered so many books that the women in this, this book of Jennifer's have written and contributed to our cultural literacy. And it's just been such a gift, truly. And on top of it, sidebar, it is gorgeous. <laughs> and I don't know who your photographer was. I should have looked that up but there's something quite intimate and personal about the photographs that really makes you feel like you're connecting with each woman before you read about her plant, her garden journey, the women yeah. who've inspired her and all these things. So just my personal gratitude to you. Well, thank you so much. And it's, it's interesting because in fact, there are, uh, there are many, 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 many different photographers. Each woman actually, we worked with them to create, a, a, get a photograph from them in the places they were, but the designers did a really beautiful job of bringing them together. So they looked like sort of of a kind. And I really appreciated that. The, the cover doesn't really do justice to what's inside once you once you open it. But a lot of people have commented on uh, the photography and just the kind of like glow from each of the women. Yeah. Absolutely. So, okay, to the Q&A because I have to stop. Stop. Okay, so we have a question. Um, what advice would you offer someone who wants to pursue native garden design as a career? So many of the Hort and landscape programs focus on non-native species. Oh, and by the way, thanks. I love your book. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Jessica, for that question. I really uh, appreciate it. And I think it's a great one. And I think we are finding more and more resources all the time for native plant and ecological garden design um, across the U.S. right now. I would recommend that you go to the Ecological Landscape Alliance website. They are out of the north, uh, the northeast. And there's also um, the Illinois, um, let me get this right, Illinois Landscape and landscape contractors, it's like ILCA uh, group in the Midwest, and then the California Native Plant Society. Uh, also the um, Mount Cuba Center mm -hmm. and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, Center. Those are all great native plant hubs across the US. They will have more information for you on job opportunities, training opportunities, and good luck with that because I think it's one of the, the biggest growing sectors of the field right now. Thank you. So um, she she also said, "Go as long as you want. I have the book." <laughs> uh, which I love. And don't then, add, don't say that. I'll talk to right. her. <laughs> I'm here. I'm staying. Um, so. Another said, um, who are some women from previous generations that worked in the world of plants, women that inspired you personally? And she sees a reason to write another book for you uh, on this same subject. Thank you, Jane. Um, the, you know, it was funny because for people who haven't seen the book, one of the questions that I ask each woman is who were the women that came before you or who were women that you want more people to know about? And in that way, I was able to kind of expand on having just 75 and create this, this larger network of, you know, meet this one and learn about this one and read this book, um, which was really meaningful to me, that greater network, because I think um, it sounds a little cliche, but I, I know that's how we as women connect and learn and support each other. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, and I loved some of the answers that came from the women, like Jamaica Kincaid said, uh, Sacagawea was, was one of the women that inspired mm -hmm. her because you know she did all the work on the Lewis and Clark expedition, but she never got any credit. Um, and I just, I love that. Um, you know, my mom was a professional gardener and uh, just an avid gardener. And you knew that if she, you couldn't find her, you just had to go out in the garden and she was out there somewhere. Um, but then there are just, you know, Rachel Carson and mm -hmm. um, Constance Spry and uh, 
there's so many, I, I can't even begin to name them. Beatrix Ferrand and um, Gertrude Jekyll. They're just a, a fantastic number of, of women um, from all over who are phenomenal um, inspirations. Uh, you know, I think of Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a just a revolutionary book to me. And um, so there we go. I well, hope that answered your question. I will say this. Um, all the books you've mentioned tonight <laughs> um, are in the Cherokee Garden Library right here at the Atlanta History Center. And yeah. I actually just ordered your new book. So um, we I got to get you a signed book plate. Yes, yes. And so we invite everyone. Um, many of you are familiar with the Garden Library and the Gizweta Gardens. For those of you who are not, please come see us. Um, we're working so hard here to provide beautiful, meaningful spaces to all of Atlanta. And the same for the collection that it speaks to all of us and collectively and to different groups as what they need to relate um, and to, it's just so great the way you crafted your talk. So I'm gonna have to say good night, it's eight oh one. <laughs> um, thank you. I, thank you, Jennifer. I want to invite everybody out there, including Jennifer, um, if you're available tomorrow night, we have another great speaker coming, um, someone I also admire, Charles Blow, who is a writer for the New York Times and journalist, I've followed him for years. He's actually an Atlantan, um, and he has a new book out that I haven't started reading yet, but I have it. It's called The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto, and he's with us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Awesome. So audience out there, uh, please, it's another wonderful free virtual program for Atlanta and the broader community. Please register and be with us tomorrow night. Thank you, Jennifer. This has been such a thrill. And I know one day we'll be able to bring you here in person and I look forward to that day. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much for being with us.